Okay, so since we were talking about uh, the intellectual level and the being level, uh, my question is that uh, when we leave this uh, physical reality and, uh, you know, after our death, let's say, what obviously the being part goes with us, right? Uh, does any part of the intellect also go with us or is that something that's just a um, function of uh, being immersed in this virtual reality? Well, there's part of that intellectual that does go with you, but it doesn't last long. It decays pretty quickly. Okay. So immediately after um, making the transition, you still do have some of that intellect stuff and you still are, you know, um, connected in a way as to your old to your old lifetime. It doesn't just disappear immediately. But it disappears as does your connection with the past life. It kind of goes away. And then you're kind of left at the bean level. Uh, same same with your dreams. You know, when you're in a dream, you pretty much function at the bean level, not at the intellectual level. The things the thinking you you do in your dream, like should you run from the monster, should you stay, or should you go do this or that? Most of that's all happening at the being level. That's you using your cognitive function at the being level. Um, and you, in your dreams, you kind of are who you are. You know, you, you don't, uh, if your intellectual level, if you actually awaken your intellect in the dream, that's called lucid dreaming because now you have an intellect and you can take command of the dream. But up until that time, if you weren't lucid, then you're working out of your being level. So you, once you pass on, you, you get to the transition level, uh, you have a little intellect there and it, clo it just decays over time and it's pretty quick decay. And then it's more like the dream in the sense that you just are who you are and you're not really second guessing. You're not trying to uh, work on your image. You're not doing things because you think you should. You just are the way you are. You know, what you, what you do is, is really what you are. It's, it's very straightforward. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that you've let go with your, your fears. You have fear at the being level. It's that fear at the being level that comes back next time you incarnate and you come back in another uh, experience packet. Well, you know, you start over where you were. Yep. So it's not yep. like when you get, you know, to this transition that suddenly you become, you know, a pure white angel and you know everything and you're all wise and all grown up and so on. You're still that same person. You still function kind of at that same being level, but you don't have all the intellectual overlay on top of it yeah. anymore. Well, that's that's the entropy of your um, consciousness, right? That's yes. the entropy of your being level, yeah. 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 All right, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, uh, the, the next question is Greg's, and it, it had to do with... Okay, you're cutting out the middle of there, Justin, but I'll assume that you're ready for the question about remote viewing. Yes. Recently, I have been conducting some remote viewing experiments with a friend. While we have gotten some targets correct, more often we do not. However, the failures usually have some interesting aspect to them. We may see an object or objects near the intended target instead of the target itself. If we are using a protocol with multiple objects to choose from after impressions are gathered, with only one of those being correct. <coughs> the viewer may get impressions of the dummy objects before even knowing what they are. What are your thoughts on the cause or causes of these inaccuracies? We even we did try to narrow down our requests to the larger system uh, to only look at the correct object, but we still get uh, dummy targets and things around them. What's going on? Okay. There's several things that may be going on. Uh, one of them is that you have, you're operating both out of the being level with an intent that actually does something in an intellectual level um, too, at the same time. In other words, you can at the intellectual level say, I only want to look at the, you know, the right answers. I don't want to look at all the, the stuff that's, all the stuff that's out there. But if that's an intellectual thought, if that's a wish, then it doesn't necessarily translate over into, you know, your ability to do that. So that's one, one thing that's going on. Another thing is that it's, it takes practice to be precise with your intent. Sometimes the intents are very general. 
you know, you'll have an intent like, um, you know, somebody has something hidden in a box and your idea is what's in the box. So in your, your intent is I want to see what's in the box, but you don't really specify which box, where, at what time, you know that kind of in your intellect, you have that, you have that knowledge, but it's not really expressed at the being level. So you give some general thing at the being level and you get a general answer back. So you may get something that is going to be in the box next or something that, um, you know, is in a, is in another box because you just asked to see what was in the box. You didn't, you didn't make your, your request precise enough. And you know, that's, a, that's another possibility. The, it, when you do that, or well, maybe go back a little bit, when you're not that precise, what happens is that your, your uh, query is a, is a larger, higher level query. It's not so specific. So you get maybe multiple answers back and that's confusing. And then you tend to pick one of the answers rather than just getting the answer, you'll get multiple answers back. You know, this, this query, you know, though, that, that's like with Google, you know, you make a real general statement on Google and you'll get millions of things back. You have to be very, very specific just to get the, the thing that you want back. So that's, that's part of it is the query isn't precise enough because you know in your intellect something, but that's not the point. The point is you have to express it in, you know, through, the, through your intent at the being level, exactly what it is you want to see. And the very last thing is, is that sometimes uh, the larger consciousness system will want you to think in bigger pictures and not just focus on what's in the box. That's, that's kind of focusing on a, on a, on a technique or a, or a very particular thing. And sometimes the larger consciousness system will show you something that is you know, what's going to be in the box next? And you see it now, you know, there were three things that were going to be in the box, you know, and you see the one that hasn't even been put in there yet or other kinds of things just to kind of stir it up a bit and say, you know, this game has a lot more dimensions to it than just the one you're playing. And it's a much bigger picture. And that's sometimes done. I find people when I, in my workshops, when I do these uh, remote viewing things and I have things in boxes, you know, there were people who would say, I, you know, I had like four of them and they'd say, I got all four right, but not in the right order. So, you know, as we went through them all, they did indeed get all of those objects because I don't show them, I don't say what any of them are until the end, you see. So they've looked at four different boxes and come up with different things. And it was number one, number two, number three, and number four. Well, they got number three, number four, number two, and number one, you know, that sort of thing. But they got all four of them. And it's like, well, what's up with that? Well, they're intent was probably not being very specific and they uh, probably had their their intellect kind of mingled in with you know their being level so they were talking kind of out of both levels at the same time and sometimes the, the system is just playing with them to show them that that things are really bigger and and more complex than it would seem and don't get too tightly wound up about doing this one you know, this one thing, this one trick, because there's a lot more to it than that. So sometimes that happens too. That's, Wait, that's why you should, that's why you should always be skeptical. You know, never take what you get as, as what you think it is necessarily. You're always skeptical because there's, there's multiple reasons why you might get any particular answer. Um, a lot of times remote viewers would, would do uh, odd things like they were, they would be, told to go to a particular area and in that area maybe it was a tennis court but what they saw was a big uh, this big bulky tower like a water tower well as it turned out you know just you know 300 yards from the tennis court there was this big water tower but that wasn't the that wasn't the thing they were supposed to be looking at but that's what snagged their attention so their their uh, request or their query was general enough they wanted to see what was in that area instead of the specific target 
what's what's in this area i want to look at and see it and when they did they saw a whole bunch of things but the thing that stood out for them is the that's kind of the big thing there was a big water tower not a tennis court so then that's what they report um, it's a little hard in your intent to say i want to see what's in this area and you don't really mean that what you mean is i want to see the target you see but in your intent you say i want to see in the, you know i want to look around the area that, of of the target and you don't really realize there's a difference between those two but if you're not precise then that's what that's what happens one of them you'll see just the target just nothing but a tennis court and the other one you'll see a big water tower that's you know in the area and you're not really aware that you didn't say it precisely because in your mind you knew what you meant but that was at the intellectual level Thanks, that, that helps and that really fits with with the kind of things that happen. So I guess we kind of have a direction to uh, to improve there. It takes it that? takes a lot of, it takes a lot of practice to improve that, just to get to where your intent gets very precise and you think of all the little details. You almost have to think like a lawyer. You know, lawyers think in terms of all the possible ways that somebody could misconstrue you know what they're doing because they usually have an opponent on the other side that's trying to misconstrue it to their own benefit so they think in terms of you know how could somebody misinterpret what i'm saying and you almost have to think that way so that you uh, you're very precise in what you in what you say if you think like a normal person not like a lawyer you tend to say things and you expect people to get what you mean from the context rather than actually from the logic of your words. And that generally doesn't work that way when you're sending a query into a database. The database is not going to work on your context. It only works on what you send it. Great. Related to Greg's question, and you know, you're saying when we, ha when we say the query in our mind, um, for example, when I when I make a query, when I've done things, I say it verbally to myself in my mind. But what I've realized is that even though I'm expressing it verbally in my head, there's still chatter going on in the background at the intellectual level. So would you say that your query has to kind of be at the being level as much as possible with because of the intellectual chatter will uh, insert itself, uh, you know, unbeknownst to you half the time? Does that make sense? Yes, once you get to that point consciousness where there is no chatter, you basically have to stay there so that the chatter never comes back. You get to a point where the chatter's gone and then you stay in that state. And from then on, your awareness, your cognitive function is coming out of the being level. So if you pop back up into the intellect, then you're basically weakening your ability to both focus and to get noise-free communications. So if there's chatter going on, then that's not a good sign. Then you need to go back to the meditation, you know, get rid of the chatter and then proceed. And you may need to do that, you know, five times a minute for a long time until you get used to it. You know, you start to feel chatter, things running around in your head where you're, where you're jabbering about stuff. You know, you're analyzing, you're, you're judging, you're doing all sorts of things. Am I doing this right? Is that, should I say that again? And you have all this, this chatter going on, you need to just back up, get back into a state where you uh, are just consciousness and then start proceeding again from the from the uh, being level. And at the beginning, and I'm sure most of my, our listeners out there, they're going to see a very subtle difference between awareness at the being level and awareness at the intellectual level. And they're going to think, oh, how am I going to separate that out? It all seems the same to me. But it will separate out. The more experience you have, the clearer it is which state you're in and what's going on. And a lot of that will just have to do with your practice. As you remote view or as you heal or something, sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. And you'll go back and say, well, what was different? And mostly the difference will be when it worked, you were focused from the being level. Your mind was totally empty of chatter and thoughts. It was just you at the being level with a clear focus and when it didn't work, it was because you weren't in that state. And then you'll say, well, what, how did that feel? And it'll feel a little different. And eventually you'll build up a sense of those two being different things. But it is a difficult thing to get, you know, right off. It's, uh, it's because we, we live here in PMR 
from our intellects. And that's our normal operating basis. And we tend to drift back into that if we, you know, if we just kind of relax and don't pay attention to what we're doing, we drift right back into that intellectual space because that's what we're used to. And it's, it takes a while to separate those two spaces. Sometimes we operate from the being level. Like I say, we do in our dreams. You do uh, a lot of times uh, when you're, when you're uh, angry, when you're very emotional, you tend to function right from the being level because your, your mind isn't really thinking much anymore. And uh, so we do express ourselves genuinely and uh, with, you know, as an authentic person some of the time, but a lot of the time we're not. We're, we're, uh, we're expressing intellect and ego and it takes a while, it takes some experience. That's one of the reasons that it takes years to do this. It's because you have to learn to let go of that intellect, which is a hard thing to do. Right brain people probably find that quicker. You know, I'm a left brain person, right? Here I am, I'm a scientist, you know, I do math. I do things that are very logically process oriented. And it was something I had to work at and spend a lot of time before it got to be clear, you know, how to separate those two so that you're not you know, you haven't lost the point consciousness. You've just added a voice, uh, an awareness at the being level. So you have to maintain those. And all I can say is just practice. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. And, and uh, eventually it'll get clearer and clearer what the difference is between those two, between those two states. Yeah, Tom, this is Pali. Uh, I have one comment uh, from my experience, if I may. Um, it's f first of, about, uh, well, I, I think I understand what you mean by uh, describing this clear space, this uh, point consciousness. And I was so focused on achieving that, I completely disregarded all the, all the intermediate states which were having a positive effect onto my journey, so to speak. So uh, I wanted to ask whether it's feasible to, um, well, I find for myself that a playful approach uh, is always the best one, uh, really trying to do the best I can and being aware that I'm doing the best I can anyway. <laughs> I cannot do any better than I'm doing. Uh, and with that, uh, an easiness came uh, to my attempts and with that uh, I discovered that even though I am not able to completely disconnect uh, and to just float in the point consciousness state, not that I am aware of, uh, I still am achieving a lot of successes and uh, it gets me through uh, through the experiments. I don't build any more so much frustration as when I was uh, trying to get to that point consciousness state which you described so nicely, which seems to be that one thing that must be correct, right? So, yeah, well, you know, everybody, uh, some people get like 80% to that, that um, you know, that state, and sometimes 90, and sometimes only 10. So it's not a black and white off and on. It's, it's something you learn to get better and better at. But the reason that people will say, yes, don't take it too seriously, you know, let it be, let it be fun, you know, play with it experiment but experiment it without any idea of what it is you want to come out of it because if you go into it with a with a set here's what's going to happen here's what i want to do you know i'm going to sit down i do this i'm going to go out of body and do these things and if it doesn't happen that way now you're disappointed and all of that just builds more intellectual junk and ego and fear and all the rest of it oh, i didn't do it right i can't ever get this thing right you know it's just too hard and all of that builds up problems for you the reason that they say lighten up is because all of the intensity of trying to make it happen is all intellectual stuff. That's all fear ego stuff out of the intellect. So the harder you push on it, the less likely you are, you are to get there, the less likely you are to move it. That's why they say relax and play. It's not that you're really playing with it. It's just that you're not trying so hard. You let your intellect sit down when you play. Play is not an intellectual exercise, right? Play is a being level exercise. When you go, you know, sit down with a with a three year old and get some blocks and start building with them, or playing, uh, you know, with teacups and 
you know, a little dolls with a little girl and when you're doing these things, it's not an intellectual exercise. You're just doing it. You're being. You're just sharing that, that time and, and energy and whatever, and you're just playing. Well, that's the right approach, is to let the intellect go. And it's not that you have to take it lightly or, or not think it very serious. You can still be serious about it. You're just not wound up. You're not intellectually engaged trying to force something to happen. You just do. You be and see what happens. And then accept it happens as it happens. And realize that if you just accept what happens as it happens, what happens will change. It will start to modify, start to follow your intent. But as long as you're trying to push it with your intellect, it resists. And it doesn't really go anywhere. So you're right, a whole lot of people, you know, they talk about beginner's luck. Why do beginners have luck? Because their intellect isn't involved, because they don't expect to do very well. They don't expect that when they pick up that bowling ball that it's going to do anything other than, you know, rolling down the gutter or something, because they've never touched one before. They've never done it before. And sure enough, they get a strike. You know, it runs right down the middle and they do really well. And they say, well, that's just beginner's luck. And then they go, oh, well, maybe I can do this. I was pretty good at it. And suddenly they all roll down the gutter because now they're actually trying. They're trying to do it with their intellect and they just can't do it right because that intellect hasn't been practiced with hundreds and hundreds of games of bowling for them to get that intellect to uh, kind of relax and let go, let, let that ego uh, kind of wander off and just let the ball roll. So that's the, it's the same thing. You know, it's the idea. Once you get your intellect out of it, you can actually function much, much better. That's why anybody who does something really well usually practices at it over and over and over again. You practice so much that you let your intellect go. Now it's just something you do. You know, if you, when you learn to type, if you use your intellect, now where is that key, you know? Where's the S key? Where's the T key? You know, the E, the e key's up and over one, you know? And if you're doing that from your intellect, you'll never get more than about 10 words a minute. But if you just let your body learn the motions and let the intellect go to where you just do it without thinking about it, oh, now you can actually really type. You see, it's all the same thing. I mean, we interact with these ideas in all of our life, whether it's bowling or typing or whatever. You know, it's just, it's just the way we are. And when it comes to meditation and growing up, it's the same thing. It's not like it's a new you know, a whole new set of things. It's the same old thing. Get the intellect out of the way. Stop trying to think it through. Be, you know, just be who you are and interact. Now, there's a time for thinking it through, right? There's a time for you to assess what's going on and to make judgments. It's not that that's a bad thing to do. There's times for that, but then there's times to let it go. We just tend to dominate our whole life with it, with our intellect. Intellect's not a bad thing. Intellect's a necessary thing. You wouldn't be able to find your way home you know, if you didn't have a, a mind that could make assessments and decide where you are and what's the best route, all of that is your, your intellect thinking. But you have to use it when it's valuable and let it go when it isn't, rather than let it dominate all of your life. Tom, uh, do you think the function of the intellect is also so that we're fully immersed in this uh, experience, um, this virtual reality? And the fact that um, it's trying to, um, you know, put a block between uh, this virtual reality and what we truly are, which is consciousness. Yeah, and it does that. It has that function. Obviously, the more you connect here intellectually, then uh, you know, the less you connect here, uh, you know, at the being level. And this this world kind of pulls you pulls you in that direction. You know, to uh, solve problems with your intellect. It's a, it, that's the way the world is. So, sure, that's just part of the, that's just part of the problem. That's why, uh, from most of us, it's a, it takes a lot of practice, and uh, and growing, and we need to be kind of dedicated to it over the long term, and not just in the short term, because we're really changing ourselves at a very fundamental level, not, uh, you know, not just uh, doing what comes natural in the in the physical reality, but uh, getting to a deeper level of ourselves. And that's why not so many people will ever get there because they're completely dedicated to their intellect running their life that they can't they can't take those uh, those steps or they don't they can't see those steps. 
Mm. Looks like Raj might have froze. <laughs> I can see myself frozen on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to ch change that. Uh, it looks kind of weird, but uh... <laughs> yeah, you just have to turn off your webcam and turn it okay, back on. Okay, and restart just... it again. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, Greg, did you want to ask your your question related to the psi uncertainty principle? Okay, yeah, um, it's definitely related to that last question, and I did drop out for part of uh, answering that. So if I have more questions on the on that part, I guess I can I can uh, do that next time. But the psi uncertainty principle also relates to this, in that you've said before that that could be a factor, you know, blocking somebody from having a psychic experiment work like this. So my question is, uh, how could one who is entering a situation or experiment where the psychic uncertainty principle may come into play know whether or not their psychic attempts are truly failing, or if they're being foiled as a matter of policy? Suppose a parapsychological researcher wanted to conduct a certain type of experiment and use it to show people that a certain psychic effect is real. Assuming the experiment would normally work without any uh, science or any principle related interference, how could they know in advance whether or not they would be allowed to proceed? The answer to that is they can't. They don't know in advance. The only, uh, they'll find out when it, you know, when it, if it works all the time when they're by themselves and it doesn't work, then they'll find out when it doesn't work. But there is one way to make a good guess. And that is query your own mind as to what's your intent for doing this. Okay? And if your intent for doing this has ego at its roots and fear at its roots, that you're going to do this because, you know, people need to see that it works this way. People need to, you know, they, they need to realize that, you know, this paranormal thing happens. It's just a part of life. And I'm going to show them with the idea that you're going to kind of push this in people's faces. So they're going to have to deal with it and, and uh, realize that this is the way it is, whether they like it or not, because this is the way it is. So here, folks, see this? It's real. And now you have to deal with it, you see? Well, that's, a, that's an ego thing, you see? And if you're coming at it from that sort of a direction, then there's a higher probability that the answer is, is going to fail. You're not, you know, you're not doing it for the right reasons. Now, that, in that situation, the researcher then would say, well, maybe, uh, you know, bringing in all the movie cameras and, and forcing people to, to see that this is, this is true, that I'm not a maniac, you know, going off on this crazy uh, research and there's nothing really there. You know, I'm going to justify myself if people can see that I'm working on something real. You see, if that's a that's a different thing, and it probably is not going to work very well for you. So if you were that sort of a researcher, you probably wouldn't know until you got there that it failed, and then you've then you'd look like even a bigger fool, right? Well, you know, I had this experiment, I invited all the cameras in, and everybody was there, you know, and it didn't work, you know. Right. It never worked. You know, the guy's just nuts, you see. So now you've, you've stepped in it bigger. Well, all that, that's your feedback for having the ego. You know, you just, if you thought you were, you know, in trouble before, now you've just made it worse, which is generally what your ego does. So a researcher that looked at it and said, well, you know, it's really not that important for me to demonstrate this, you know, to the world. That's not really the thing. I need to use this to understand more how the world works and how these things work. I need to get a bigger picture and I can present that bigger picture to people in ways that they can, you know, they can take it or leave it. I'm not going to push it in their face and say, here it is, you know. So that then would mean he probably wouldn't call in all the cameras to try to do his demonstration that would show something because there really wouldn't be much point in that. You can't push people who aren't ready. And if you do try to push people who aren't ready, usually it just backfires. They don't really grow from it. Instead of, see, if you, if, you, if you did that, and here you are, and the cameras are rolling, and, you know, you levitate, uh, you know, yourself, you know, 10 feet off the floor, and so on, what happens is that you end up just ruining your own reputation, because people look at that and say, ah, that was a trick. I've seen magicians do that. You know, that wasn't real. 
So this guy not only is a, is a researcher doing this stuff, but he's also a fraud. He's, you know, there he is on film, you know, doing the part of tricks. And see, it gets back to you. Even if it didn't fail, it fails. Because if people aren't ready for it, forcing them to see something they're not ready to deal with or process isn't helpful. They just won't do that. It won't work. Even though there it is, and you had an audience, and you had it all on film, it still doesn't work. See, so that's the, you know, that's the problem. You have to realize that mm, that's really not what you're trying to do is to, you know, force people to see things or impress people with your skills or demonstrate things that that's not the point. Now you need to focus your research someplace else. You do need to understand and you would like to find out. And you do have to do these experiments because you have to convince yourself that it's real. And once you've convinced yourself that it's real, then you're not all that needed, you know, do a whole lot more of that because you realize that's not really going to get you anywhere. It's not really on a path going someplace. So I get people write into me like that all the time, you know, just go do a miracle, you know, and then everybody would know that it was true. You know, well, of course, that's silly. You know, you do a miracle and everybody knows that you've just faked it because that's what they believe. And just because they see you doing that on a video, well, you can see people flying on videos, you know. Uh, Mary Poppins comes down out of the sky with an umbrella, you know, on videos. So that doesn't mean anything. You say, you can see anything happen on a video. That doesn't convince anybody of anything else. Now, the people who are there standing around you, you know, while you levitate, now it's real for them. But anybody else who sees it later, and even if all of them, you know, write out a, 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 an affidavit, I was there and, you know, there weren't any tricks and this is the way it really is, then they're just all co-conspirators, you see, to the larger reality. They're just all co-conspirators. They're in it with you. It's a gag. You're playing a trick on everybody, right? You see? So it's not, you kind of have to look at your motivation. Why are you doing this? You know, why would you want to, to do these things? And the best answer is because I want to know. I want to convince myself that, this is the way it works. And once you convince yourself, then you're pretty much done with that. Or the other thing that's a good answer is, I wanna understand it. I wanna do it and do it and do it enough that I really see what is causing it. What are my limitations? What works, what doesn't work? Because as you do that, it'll help you grow because you'll find that the only thing that works is you growing up, you see? So the actual trying to do the the uh, paranormal things will lead you to grow up because that's what you have to do to get it to work. And after you've tried it hundreds of times, that starts to become clear. It has more to do with my attitude and my intent and why I'm working at it. And, you know, do I really care about that person, my healing, or are they just a, you know, like a rock, you know, something I'm studying to see how it works. You know, if I poke it this way, how does it move? You see, or is there really some connection, some empathy there with that person as an individual. Well, if they're just a thing you're like poking and see how it moves, then you'll find you're not going to develop very far that way. And then you'll think, well, the ones where I really had a strong empathetic connection, that worked really well, you see. So it helps you. So there are ways that it is very beneficial for you. Not only do you prove it to yourself so you can get over this, is it real or is it not issue, but you also help yourself grow in a positive direction because that's the direction that these things will nudge you to go in in order to be successful with it. And besides, it's fun, right? These are, these are fun games to play. And uh, as, uh, as long as they're productive for you, then there's no harm in them. Now, there is a, there is a problem with some people will get uh, wound up in a paranormal thing. Oh, I can see auras. I can look at people's, you know, emotional things. I can tell when they're lying. I can do these things. And that's such a cool thing that they get wound up in that. And that becomes very important. And it makes them important in their own mind. And that then, of course, is very detrimental to their growth. So you kind of have to have the, a good intent of why you're doing these things or it can trap you as well. So there's probably as many people that get trapped by paranormal uh, phenomena as those that it actually leads to a better place. It can happen either, either way. That's why some traditions kind of 
I don't know, not, not deny it, but basically tell all of their adherents, don't go there. Don't do that stuff. You know, don't do the, you know, we don't want a remote view. We don't want to go out of body. We don't want to do any of these things. It's just, you know, we go to the point consciousness state, we become authentic beings, and that's, that's all we do. To go past that, to want to go heal somebody or this or that or affect the outside world, that's just ego. It's just you trying to affect things. Well, if it turns out that that's all it is, then they're right. You know, it's not advantageous to you, but it doesn't have to be that. You can be doing things and learning from it and growing from it. And it, it can be a very significant part of your growth. So I disagree with those um, that say, don't go there. You know, once you've had, once you've gotten to point consciousness, you're done. You know, that's nirvana. You just hang out there and anything else is chasing your ego. Could be, but doesn't have to be. Other things can also be rewarding and can be on your growth path. You don't have to get trapped by your ego. That's just a possibility, but it's not the only possibility. You can learn from it as well. You can grow from it as well. Not in, not in that you get better and better at it, which you can with practice, but uh, you, you learn the limitations of it. Like I've told people in, in some of my workshops, the people who are really the most gifted and the most capable in doing paranormal things are the people who do paranormal things the least. They really don't care a whole lot about it. You see, those two go together and that's hard for people to understand. They said, oh, if I could do that stuff, I, you know, I'd use it all the time. I could tell if somebody was lying to me and I could do this, I could do that. I could look at the future probabilities, you know, I know what was coming, you know, I know how to invest my money. I mean, wow, if I had that stuff, you know, I'd, just, I'd be all over it. I'd always use it. What do you mean the people who can really do it don't use it? Ah, whole thing must be bogus then. That doesn't make any sense. You see, that doesn't compute for people, but that's the way it is. You, you get to the point that you've learned from it, you've grown from it, and there really isn't much point then in, in doing it. But when you're beginning, you need to make you need to get to that point where you believe that there's something real there. It's not just you making stuff up and doing these kind of evidential things like you're doing, Greg, is is important part of that process because we're left brain. We got to see it. We got to see that logical process. And if we can't see it, then we're not so sure it's real. So it's a you know, it's an important step for some people, other people, the right brain people they can skip that step. They know it's real, you know, they live in it, but they can't explain it. They don't understand it. They just know that's the way it is and they've adapted to it, but they couldn't help anybody else get there. And they're not even really sure how or why it works or what the limitations are. They've just, it's always come natural to them. Well, it's better if you have both. Just being right brain is very limiting, just like just being left brain is very limiting. Neither one is as strong as being, you know, both brain, being left brain and right brain, where you have that intuitive side of you very well developed, but you also have that logical process side of you very well developed too, and you can use both of them where they both work best instead of forcing the, you know, the intellect, the, the, the left brain to run everything or having the right brain run everything, be balanced to where each can do what they do best. That's, that's really where we're trying to go. So if you start out as a left brain person, like you must be Greg, because you're trying to do these things to, you know, to see if it works. And I was the same way, that's where I was, then uh, it's good for you to work it this way. That's what you need, it's your path. Other people might have a, you know, might have a different path. That's why I was, you know, like I said earlier, you, uh, you uh, find your own path. And it's, it's not that you should worry about ever doing it wrong. Just keep after it and it'll, it'll always lead you to the right place. If your intent is, is good. Uh, Tom, to add to that, uh, you know, even the yogic traditions uh, in India, they say that uh, the more you practice that and people are able to, let's say, expand their awareness, just, you know, they they get these abilities to, um, um, you know, you can call that paranormal or whatever. They get these siddhis. Um, you know, who talks about that? It's Dean Radden. 
he he wrote a book on the paranormal and he was talking about the siddhis right so these are just a natural byproduct of being able to mm -hmm. expand your consciousness uh, but then a lot of people as they're making progress they fall in the trap because then they start using these abilities for some material gain in this physical reality as opposed to the real growth is growing your being level right so then they get stuck at a certain level and they stop progressing um, so just to add to what you were mentioning earlier that uh, we don't want to fall in the trap of uh, you know thinking that oh now we have these superman abilities and try to take advantage of those uh, but you can use these just for your own growth and to learn how the larger reality works yes yeah so uh tom you've really given me some answers there that help for for my own experiments and my own self going forward and i i kind of wanted to to ask a little more the hypothetical parapsychological researcher like raj mentioned dean rodden but let's not focus on one person because if you have a person like that who isn't necessarily doing these things as their own powers you know they have they have subjects and experiments who, who they're testing on and they're just trying to find out from a very you know scientific viewpoint if these things are real or not and yet they eventually might get foiled by the psychic uncertainty principle is that just a matter of how how wide their message is going and whether or not that goes against the interests of the larger system um yes the last part it's not necessarily how wide it tend to it's it's how how that message gets out if they are doing this research which is a good thing to do and they publish it in their journals and and uh, other uh, uh, places that publish that then that's not really pushing anybody you know only the people who want to know go read that read that journal and look at that research and Eventually, you know, it may be bubbled into a wide audience, but it's not a watch me do this demonstration, you know, sort of thing. So it's good. They shouldn't run into a lot of psi uncertainty, you know, pushing at them because it's it's kind of a, um, you know, drips very slowly into the larger um, awareness and it's not pushy. So that's. I'd say that's fine and it shouldn't trip them up very much. It's where they decide to uh, grandstand and, uh, you know, make a big show of it is where they generally get into trouble with the science uncertainty principle. As long as they just do the research and publish the research, that's not, that's not such a big problem. You know, eventually, we should grow up to the point that the science uncertainty principle changes a lot. You know, it's not really a a part of the rule set. It's more like company policy is the way I describe it. And the reason it's company policy is because it's the way we are. It's not, uh, it's not useful to push things in people's faces that don't understand it. People have to grow up on their own. And you wouldn't want a lot of people to be given tools that they weren't really, they didn't earn. They really weren't grown up enough to deal well with it. We'd end up in a worse place instead of a better place. So once we grow up more, if the level of, of conscious quality in our culture were to take a great leap forward and to grow up, then that psi uncertainty principle would start to loosen up some. So it wouldn't be the same. So it's not like a fixed thing we'll always have to deal with. It's just there as a practical constraint on our culture so we don't you know, shoot ourselves in the foot. That's, uh, that's kind of the, you know, the point of it. So it's good for these things, for you know the Dean Radens of the world to do their research and to put that out there, and it will dribble into the mainstream a little bit, bits by little bit, sort of like a an IV drip, right? Where it just kind of it's an IV drip into the consciousness uh, of the of our culture, and that helps. That will probably help our culture grow up, and it's not pushy and it's not invasive. It's only the people who are ready go there and get an interest in it. And all the people are not ready, just blow it all off as being nonsense. And, uh, you know, these people are tricking themselves or they're, they're lie, you know, they're liars and cheats or whatever it is they, you know, the, the average people do to blow that away from their thinking because it interferes with their beliefs. So I, I think all this research is good. It's part of the solution to have this, this constant 
drip into the larger conscious system so that people get exposed to it. And the Dean Radin publishes his books. That's all good. That's all beneficial to the whole. And I don't think the science certainty principle will squeeze them as long as they, you know, as long as they continue to do it in that kind of way that isn't that isn't pushing. And good science isn't pushing. Good science is, you know, usually uh, published and spread around among people who are interested, and that's as far as it goes.